joined by a sun-kissed Eddie Hearn. Eddie, before we discuss the upcoming schedule, the news broke yesterday that, unfortunately, Cash Farouk, a fighter with the world at his feet, had been forced to retire. I speak on behalf of everyone in the boxing community and certainly everyone at Matchroom that it truly is a real shame to hear this. What was your reaction when you first heard that news? Yeah, I mean, look, for, you know, for a while now, we've we've been speaking to Cash and his team and uh, we've known that there, there could be an issue with his, uh, the future of his career, which was obviously always worrying. Um, it got to the point where, you know, he was unable to continue as a professional fighter. Um, devastation for, for Cash, really, because we know that his whole life is boxing. You know, from a young age, it's really all that he's known and it's all that he's dedicated himself to. Um, although he achieved so much in the sport, I believe there was huge things to come for Cash Farouk. Of course, the rematch with, with Lee McGregor, but also I believe he had a great opportunity to go on and become a world champion, um, a, a lovely young man. And, um, you know, at times like this, it's very difficult. You have to kind of just realise that you are OK. You're still breathing. You've still got opportunity to wake up every morning. And although something's been taken away from you, you have to now put your focus into something else in your life, which is difficult for people that love what they do. Um, you know, obviously his role now at the uh, St Andrews Sporting Club is going to be a, a role that he can get his teeth into. Nothing will take away from the pain that he will feel through missing the sport of boxing. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, God has plans for us and his plan was that this was his time. To, to walk away from the sport. Um, so, of course, disappointing for everyone. We wish him all the best. Here to support him um, with everything that he does. And I believe he can play a major role in the sport of boxing. He's a great young man with a great boxing mind. And uh, we wish him all the, the success and happiness in whatever the future holds. And you have to look forward to that future with excitement. With regards then to the new calendar year, we've just announced the opening design schedule for the first string of shows in 2022. Firstly, a fight that has been long in the making. Liam Smith and Jesse Vargas will finally do battle on February the 5th. How excited are you for this one? Really excited because, you know, it's got a little bit of spite to it. Both guys have kind of been egging each other on. And both guys need this fight. You know, for, for Jesse Vargas, lost to Mikey Garcia last time out in a good fight. He's a two-division world champion. He wants to go back and be in those big fights. Liam Smith has wanted this fight. And, you know, after his defeat against Kerbinov, which should never have really come, I told him that, you know, the Fowler fight is the kind of fight that the winner will emerge from with a huge profile. You know, those two sold out Echo Arena. It gave uh, Liam Smith the opportunity to raise his profile, to land this big fight with Jesse Vargas. And Phoenix is a great fight city. You know, we've been there before. It's a pure 50-50 fight. It's an absolute must-win fight for both guys. It's going to be an absolute war. And, of course, it's part of a doubleheader as well for the WBC world title with Quadras against Rungvisai, which will kick up his own great fight and great atmosphere in Phoenix as well. So a really good way to start the year with, of course, American, Mexican and UK interest in what will be a great night of boxing. I was with Liam in Liverpool yesterday and he was telling me he's really got his mojo and his hunger back after that victory in the Battle of Liverpool. How important do you believe that win over Fowler will be in just in terms of the momentum for him to take into this fight? So important and so many different reasons. One, that it was a good performance. Two, you know, there wasn't a spare seat in the house in Liverpool that night. Three, it was a huge audience, you know, with a lot of interest in that fight as well. And, and you know, both guys were, unex you know, it was an unexpected approach to both guys about that fight. I know that Anthony Fowler lost that fight, but he himself, you know, did, did himself proud, made a lot of money, will now move up to middleweight as well. But for Liam Smith, it was just a kickstart that he needed to go on. And if he beats Jesse Vargas, which he believes he can, He's in such a great position to go on and, and challenge for a belt again at 154. You know, he's a former world champion. Liam Smith is an outstanding fighter. You know, really only two defeats in the record. One was a really great fight with Munguia, and the other one was Canelo Alvarez. You know, this is a world-class operator, and so is Jesse Vargas. It's, it's a brilliant, brilliant fight, and uh, it's going to really set fire, that one. Our first UK show of the year lands at Alexandra Palace on February 12th. Danny Jacobs making his UK debut, coming over to fight. John Ryder, just tell us how this one came about. Well, I mean, firstly, how good is it to be back at Ali Pally? You know, I was actually thinking earlier that it was Audley Harrison against Michael Sprott the last time we were there, but actually it was Tony Bellew against Edison Miranda. That was over nine years ago since we were at Alexandra Palace. We've just obviously wrapped up there with a the dart. It is a brilliant, brilliant venue. And the response we've had already across social media for this fight and for this venue is, I want to go to that because, you know, I'd like to go to 
Ali Pali for the fight night. And it's going to be a huge crowd. Um, I'm really pleased about this fight because I've needed to deliver for both guys. You know, Daniel Jacobs was the first guy that put his trust in matchroom boxing in the U in USA, you know, when we did a deal with him and HBO. Um, he's always told me one of his dreams is to fight in the UK. Obviously ended up fighting Derevchenko and Canelo Alvarez. But now he gets the chance to fight in the UK. For John Ryder, Tony Sims, Charlie, those guys put huge pressure on me to deliver for Danny, uh, for John Ryder. You know, and I'm close with all those guys. I felt a huge amount of responsibility to produce a big fight for him. You know, for Danny Jacobs, it's must win. For John Ryder, it's must win. That fight likely to be an eliminator for the WBA world title. And just a really, really good fight. You know, Jacobs, he's coming off. The Canelo Alvarez fight, or firstly the Derevchenko victory, the Canelo Alvarez defeat, um, the, the Chavez victory, and then the draw against Rosado, where he really underperformed. And he'll be looking to make a big statement. And he'll love it. He'll love it in London. It's so good to bring a massive name over from the States to fight in the UK. And uh, we want to see more of that in 2022. We saw John put in the performance of his career, really, against Callum Smith in Liverpool in a fight. He unfortunately fell, fell short on the scorecards that night. Many thought he won that fight. John still feels to this day he won that fight. But do you believe he has to replicate that level of performance if he, if he is to beat Danny Jacobs? Yeah, I mean, look, Danny Jacobs' performance against Rosado was under par. But Danny Jacobs is an elite super middleweight. I mean, he's a world-class fighter. He's a two-division world champion. Um, he is a top, top. I mean, he just, you know, amateur pedigree, everything. And John Ryder will need to produce the performance of his career to beat Daniel Jacobs on that night. Because you know, I think if you would have got Daniel Jacobs that came just after the Chavez fight, you know, the one that turned up for Rosado, John might be a favourite going into that fight against. But this is not. This is a guy who's got a chip on his shoulder. He's coming to the UK to do a job. And this is career-defining for Daniel Jacobs because if he loses in London to John Ryder, I think, he, I think that's the end of his career. So he'll be coming to put on a spiteful performance and looking to win. And for John Ryder, like I said, he's going to have to put in a brilliant performance. He's worked so hard for this opportunity. You know, John Ryder, just down the road in Islington, he's going to have huge support there as well. It's going to be a brilliant fight and a, and a really good night. Great card to announce soon. I mean, we're going to announce the undercards over the coming days for these fights, but you've already seen big John Fisher, you know, assemble the Romford Bull Army for Ali Pali on February uh, the 12th, and they're going to probably fill it up themselves. So uh, tickets on sale very soon for that one. It will certainly be lively. Moving on then to February 27th, Lawrence Acoli making the second defence of his WBO Cruiserweight World title, a voluntary against Poland's Mikhail Seslak. No unification just yet, but this is a camp that Lawrence is going to have to get his teeth into for what promises to be a tough fight. This is a really tough fight. I mean, Seslak for a long time has been a, a very accomplished uh, cruiserweight. He's an elite cruiserweight. Um, you know, I think that unquestionably the toughest fight of Lawrence Acoli's career so far. You know, we had the, the winner of Igor of Gulamar in planned, but that fight fell through because of COVID in December. That might even end up on the undercard for this fight as well. And obviously, Makabu's waiting around for Canelo Alvarez, and Breedis has a, a mandatory against Opataya. So this is the route we take uh, for a defence. It's a very, very good fight. Uh, it's going to be a Sunday at the O2. We're going to try something different. Uh, we're going to have a fantastic card as well. And um, I'm looking forward to a statement from Lawrence Acoli, and hopefully... We nail the unification for, for, for the summer because inevitably he will make the move up to a heavyweight, but he must unify before he does that because I believe he can go through the whole division. On to March the 5th then. It's 1-1 one, one between Juan Estrada and Chocolatito. You said that the second instalment was the best fight you've ever seen live. Was it just a no-brainer for you to run it back for a third time? Oh, I mean, look, this fight was supposed to happen last October, November, and uh, um, Chocolatito got covid we had to reschedule this fight. I and mean, when you get, I mean, the, the second fight was the best fight I've seen live. The first fight was unbelievable. So when you've got two fight of the year contenders and it's 1-1, you have to run it back to the trilogy. Um, to do it in San Diego, which is just the perfect place to do this fight, it is going to be a brilliant, brilliant night of boxing. Two absolute legends, two pound for pound greats. March 5th, live on the zone from San Diego. The trilogy, I mean, it doesn't even need any selling. Juan Estrada against uh, Roman Gonzalez. It's just, it's just a dream fight to make. And it's an honour to deal with these three because this is, you know, as a promoter, these are the, that's the kind of, you know, historic fights that you get the opportunity to, to stage between two greats of the sport. 
And as you mentioned, with Rung Vasai Quadras, their rematch falling on the Smith Vargas card, is it logical to think we could see the winners of both fights uh, facing off against each other later in the year? I think so. You know, I think uh, obviously Quadras is a great fighter, as is Rung Vasai. The winners could fight the winners there. You know, don't expect, don't, sorry, be surprised if you see Julio Cesar Martinez go up to Superfly as well and, and challenge those guys. But, you know, all eyes on that trilogy. Like I said, you, you know what you're going to get from those two. Just, you know, unbelievable volume punching, unbelievable activity, unbelievable drama. And it's going to be a massive night March 5th. Now, this next fight in the schedule is a real pick and fight. Lee Wood facing Mick Conlon on March 12th in Nottingham. Just talk to us about this matchup. Brilliant fight. You know, for me, one of the standout fights of, of the schedule for many reasons. One, because it's a 50-50 fight. Two, because, you know, it's Nottingham, UK against Belfast. And, you know, it's just it's just a brilliant, brilliant, call it a domestic fight, but it's a world-level fight. Mick Conlon, great fighter, great personality. Has he got the ability to go on and, and beat Lee Wood, who is in the absolute prime of his career, um, especially mentally under Ben Davison, you know, really fancies this opportunity. I'm really pleased to give it to him in Nottingham because I think he deserves that after the Kanzu win. That being said, I expect it to be a 50-50 split between Belfast and Ireland and, and Nottingham on, on March 12th. I think the atmosphere in that arena, I remember back to Carl Froch against Lucien Buto, probably one of the best atmospheres I've ever experienced. And for a long time, I've wanted to bring a big fight night back to Nottingham. Now, we brought a next gen back there with Lee Wood against Ryan Doyle, but this is something completely different. You're going to have two, three, three and a half, four thousand Irish in there, and the rest of the arena are going to be full up with, with uh, Nottingham fans and English fight fans. And, you know, I think that um, it's going to be a fantastic fight as well. I expect this fight to be for the Super Championship um, of the WBA, and I think the winner could go on and unify with the winner of Martinez against Warrington as well. But a massive night in the career of both. The atmosphere is going to be sensational. The fight itself will be a cracker. And, and yeah, I can't wait. And you mentioned Ben Davison earlier there. It is Ben Davison versus Adam Booth in the corners. Mm. You're expecting this to be a great tactical battle between two great boxing brains in those two? Uh, yeah, I do. But also, I think there's so much on the line. I think the atmosphere will be so raucous. I think it's just going to explode into a great fight. Neither guy can afford to, to try and nick this fight. Neither guy can afford to be too clever in this fight. And they're going to have to get stuck in. And the atmosphere will, will mean that they will get stuck in. And, and like I said, going back to Froch against Butte, which, you know, had a lot of Romanians there, actually, funnily enough, to support uh, Butte. And it was a great atmosphere. You're going to see a brilliant, brilliant atmosphere March 12th. March 19th, then, a huge night for Michael McKinson. He collides with Virgil and Teed, who, of course, has stopped all 18 who have stood before him so far. How big of an opportunity is this for Mikey to prove he belongs on the world stage? Unbelievable. I mean, you know, this schedule, this is the fight that makes me most happiest because you get a kid like Michael McKinson, you know, who with MTK, boxed on MTK, smaller shows, always as an opponent, always in the away corner, always having to take fights that people felt he shouldn't have to take. Stepped up on our show, boxed Chris Congo, another guy that many people didn't really want to fight, beat him. Come on, beat Renowski at fight camp, sign with us and just get so, and, and let's have it right. The opportunity is everything. But the payday is something that will secure Michael Mickinson's future. And that is what the sport of boxing is all around. You know, you talk about cash group. This is a short career. And to see Michael Mickinson go from where he was and what he was having to go through to the biggest of stages and a huge payday and an opportunity to just become an overnight sensation and beat Virgil Ortiz, don't get me wrong, Virgil Ortiz, I rate so highly. But Michael McKinson has a style that is difficult for anyone. And if he can get in a rhythm, he's going to cause major problems to Ortiz. It's going to be tough. It's going to be brutal. But he has the opportunity, and I'm so pleased to deliver it for him. It's a massive night for him, Portsmouth, British boxing. And March 19th out there, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough for him. But he's up for it. This is the opportunity he was after. And good luck to him. Go and shock the world, son. Now, we come on to a rematch happening nearly five years on from the first meeting, Kiko Martinez versus Josh Warrington, two March 26th in Leeds. Not the Kiko Galahad rematch we'd been expecting. Can you just talk us through that development? Yeah, I mean, um, Kiko Martinez made it very clear that he wanted to rematch Josh Warrington. You know, he felt that he beat him in that first fight. He feels that he's in the form of his career right now. Um, he wasn't 
mad about the Kid Galahad uh, rematch. He wanted to do it in Spain if he did it. And to be honest with you, I don't see how the numbers may make uh, sense there. But more importantly, I feel, and I think it's general consensus now, is that Kid Galahad needs to move to 130 pounds. You know, he hasn't looked right, whether he thinks so or not, on the scales for his last two fights. He's been at featherweight for a long time. And it's very likely that Kid Galahad will return at 130 pounds on the Wood Conlon card in Nottingham. Um, and go on and, and challenge actually to, to become a two division champion. I think that move up will do him good. But Kiko was quite adamant that he wanted to rematch Josh Warrington. I think Josh was quite surprised. You know, he he obviously vacated his world title a while ago and then suffered a defeat to Maurizio Lara. He was looking for a big fight in America, maybe the, the trilogy with Lara. And, you know, I spoke to him and said, Look, I've got to ask you, Kiko has asked to fight you. And he just couldn't take the opportunity quick enough, you know, to, to try and become a two-time world champion in front of his home crowd in Leeds. It's going to be an amazing atmosphere. And it really gives him the opportunity to go on and have that big unification fight now. You know, I think it's a really tough fight. There is an argument that Josh Warrington is not the fighter that he was when he boxed Kiko the first time. Kiko's confidence is through the absolute roof right now. I think it's going to be a brilliant fight. But if Josh Warrington can win that fight, you know, you've got the big unification between the winner of Con and Wood a couple of weeks before. You've got the Navarrete fight in America. You know, so many doors will open for him as world champion. And uh, it's an unexpected fight, but a brilliant fight. And again, another great atmosphere that we'll see in a UK ring. Just then, Eddie, with regards to tickets and full on the card information, when can fans expect all this to be released? So obviously, in chronological order, you'll get some information about the Ali Pally event dropping soon, then Lawrence Acoli, then Wood Conlon then Warrington against Martinez, et cetera. And obviously, April comes soon. We hope to give you the, the brilliant news about Taylor Serrano, hopefully in the next week or so um, for April. Of course, we've got to reschedule the, the Joshua uh, Usyk rematch as well. Connor Ben expected to return in April and Callum Smith. So much more to come in the schedule. So stand by across my socials and Matron Boxing socials for ticket information. Get yourself there for what will be some brilliant, brilliant nights. And it's a tremendous start to 2022 and so much more to come as well. You just mentioned Joshua Rusick there. I just wonder, because if I don't ask you this question, I will get in trouble. Is there any development with regards to Fury, Dillian White, or perhaps that rematch with Joshua Rusick? No, I mean, you know, actually, uh, Alex Crassett called me just before this Zoom and I said I'd call him back in 20 minutes. So we're working on the dates and the venues for that fight. Um, not much happening on the Dillian White Tyson Fury fight, but a lot happening behind the scenes. Um, and I think just stand by. You know, you've got obviously the schedule set today to the end of March. And then as we go into April, you can expect to see Joshua Rusick and maybe even White against Fury in, in April and Connor Ben and, and uh, Callum Smith and so much more to come. So blockbuster year and um, stand by for the heavyweight news as well. Well, we look forward to getting started. The year begins with Vargas Smith, February 5th, live on The Zone. Eddie Hearn, thanks for your time as always.